And so I have six o'clock. Um, I'd like to call the March 9th, 2021 governing board meeting of CV Fiber to order. Uh, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Please, no additions. Yeah, potentially. Yep. Like, what, what, do you have, yep. what do you have in mind, Jerry? I have the uh, bookkeeper's invoice. Okay. That I would I would like to add so that we can get her paid. And I can bring that up during the uh, treasurer's report. That sounds great. I think we can do that. Did you have a clerk report on there, um, or do we want to skip that for this meeting? Uh, if you have something to report, I will I will give you a slot after the treasurer's report. Jeremy, what do you think? Um, I mean, yeah, it's pretty quick. Okay. And I think I'm supposed to report every month, so I'm going to do that real quick. Okay, David? I have another item on developing a... Uh, a memorandum of agreement of a contract or something with EC Fiber Valley Net for the Rock, Rock, Northfield Roxbury project. Okay. Is, is that a report back or an action item? No, that's an action item. That, uh, okay. 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 Adding that to my notes here. Just a second. Okay. Uh, anything else to be added to our quite busy? agenda okay so um i'd like to introduce uh lucy and i see you down there lucy i don't see katarina here so in katarina's absence you are the voting delegate for uh, washington so thank you for for attending um if we could do a quick uh, round of introductions uh just so lucy knows who we all are and what we're doing here, so uh, I'm Jeremy Hansen. I'm, I'm the chair of uh, uh, CB Fiber, and I represent Berlin. And uh, yeah, and, and actually, Christian, if, if you would, uh, we'll circle back around to you at the end. If you could give us a brief intro, that would be great too. Thank you, David, for that. Uh, Phil, want to go next? Uh, sure. Uh, Phil Hayek, delegate from Middlesex and vice chair of the board. Thanks, Phil. Uh, John Morris. Okay, John is muted and from Marshfield. Uh, Jeremy? Uh, oh, yeah, me, okay. Hi, I'm uh, Jeremy Matt, I'm the clerk and the alternate delegate from Washington. Thanks, Jeremy. Siobhan? Hi, uh, Siobhan Paracon, she, her. I'm the delegate from Orange and I sit on various committees. Thanks, Siobhan. Alan? I'm Alan Gilbert. I'm the delegate from Worcester, and I'm on I, the finance and policy committees. Thanks, Alan. Josh? Hello, oh, I'm uh, Josh Jarvis, and I am the delegate for the town of Barry. Thanks, Josh. David? David Healy, the delegate from the town of Callis and the chair of the planning and development committee. Thanks, David. R.D.? R.D. Eno, Delegate for Cabot, member of the Communications Committee. Hi. Thanks, R.D. Tom? Hi, Tom Fisher, Delegate for East Montpelier. Thanks, Tom. Ray? Hi, Ray Pelt here. I'm from Northfield, and I'm on the Finance and PDC Committees. All right. Michael? Hi, Lucy. Hi, Christian. I'm from Plainfield. I'm the Delegate, and I'm on the Planning Committee. Jerry? Jerry Diamantides, I'm the treasurer. I'm also on the finance committee and on the planning development committee. Thanks, Jerry. Chuck? Hi, Chuck Bird, delegate from Moortown, and I share the communications committee. And I'd like to point out that both David and Ray are modest. They also serve on the communications oh, committee. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> Henry Amistadi, I'm the delegate for, from Duxbury. Thanks, Henry. Katarina? Katarina Mack, a delegate from Washington, a member of no committee. 
Thanks, Catherine. And, uh, Ken? <laughs> yeah, I'm Ken Jones. I'm the delegate from Montpelier and a member of the Planning and Development Committee. All right. Um, Lucy, I, I introduce you as the alternate. If there's anything else that you want to tell us about you, that would be great. No, that's uh, that's good. Sorry, I had myself muted earlier. Um, uh, alternate from Washington. Thanks, Lucy. And Christian? Hi, uh, yeah. Uh, Christian Meyer um, with the CBRPC for all of uh, a little over a week now. Uh, my background is transportation planning, but I'm excited to be working with this group. Um, I think there's a lot of overlap, uh, certainly from my point of view. And I just want to express uh, two points. One, just uh, thankful for the opportunity uh, for Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission to be working with you. And also, um, Bonnie wanted to say that she had hoped to be here uh, in person, but this is also the night of our uh, commissioner, our board of commissioners meeting. So it's going to be a pretty tight conference. But looking forward to this. All right. So thanks to all of you, everybody who's here in this meeting. Um, I couldn't do it without all of your help. So I very much appreciate that. Um, any public comment? Any other comments on items that are not on the agenda? Um, Jeremy, do you want me to talk about big budget now or at the end? It, it, maybe if you could just just drop this here because okay. it might inform some okay. later discussions. So, so the federal legislation that's the $1.9 trillion will have $1.2 billion coming to the state of Vermont and uh, is to address the impacts of COVID and the, the ideas that are being circulated. I, I think there is no question that of that money um, that there will be at least $100 million sent to broadband. And, and I think it will probably be decided by the legislature later in the session or in a summer session because they're going to have to determine the spending of 1.2 billion and they're not going to do that quickly. Um, but again, I, from the sentiment from the governor's office and from the legislature, there is going to be a significant portion. And I think it'll be at least $100 million. It could be $200 million. It will be dedicated to broadband and the CUDs will be very, very important recipients of that money. Um, so it's just going to be up to us to help the legislature understand specifically how we can use that money. But, but again, we're going to have some time. But that's an addition. There are also line items in that 1.9 trillion that have to do with um, health and public safety. And, and so those will also be carved out. But in terms of getting money straight to us, there will be money. Um, that, that I am 99% certain. All right. Thanks for that, Ken. Any other comments about items that are not on the agenda? Okay. Moving I'm along. Sorry. Yes, I do. Oh, go uh, ahead. Uh, I just note that you passed out materials which included the uh, draft policy committee charter yet i don't i don't see that on the agenda policy committee charter um i'm looking at your email of um the march 5th it says materials for tuesday's meeting okay i meant to send out the finance and audit committee charter i wasn't okay. meaning to send out the policy committee charter so i wasn't sure that the policy committee had approved that or had it so both the, 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 the finance and audit committee charter is also in the same email. Oh, okay. So that's probably why I didn't uh, include that there. So policy charter, I will put after the finance and audit committee charter. Um, so I'm going to be uh, sanguine with everybody. This is, this is a gigantic agenda and we will not get to all of this. We will have another meeting in two weeks. It's not, it's not going to be avoidable this month. Um, if that sounds like an apology, it's it's not. It's just just reality. Um, thank you for that, Ray. I I apologize for the uh, for the oversight. Any anything else that needs to be added to the agenda before we move on? Okay. So um, I'm going to move that we approve the consent agenda, which includes the approval of the February 9th minutes. 
um, and the two bills that we've already paid for the, um, I'm sorry, for one bill that we've already paid, which is our insurance through Philadelphia Insurance, and then to approve a stipend, not a stipend, to approve a budget for the treasurer to buy postage and supplies in Second. the amount of uh, up to $100. Thanks, Siobhan. That's got a terrible breach of protocol to second before even the sentence is done, but okay. I think that's cheating, Siobhan, honestly. <laughs> I had to I'm be first. first. I had to be first. All right. I, I'm, I, I'm the chair and I'll rule it in order, so we'll we'll move on. Okay. Any, any other uh, discussion on the consent agenda? Okay. So all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 So aye. any opposed? Uh, abstentions or roll call requests. Okay, motion passes unanimously. Thanks, everybody. Treasurer's report, Jerry. Uh, yeah, and I can, I can make this pretty pretty quick. We got our uh, 2020 financials, quote unquote, from the from the bookkeeper, which is the uh, kind of the uh, aggregation of everything that was done for 2020. Our 2020 financials. Um, you've already seen the deposit details and the check details. That's exactly the same as what I had presented uh, last month, I believe. She pulled together a balance sheet and a profit and loss sheet that um, I would like to present to the Finance Committee first before we bring it to the board. Um, there's, there's no problems there, but I just think it's, it's appropriate. I just got it today, so uh, yesterday, so I think it's appropriate to bring to the board. Um, no surprises. It's 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 all it totally in line with what I had presented um, uh, last month. Our uh, our bank balances are right now for the checking account eighty three thousand dollars eighty three thousand nine hundred sixty four dollars ninety five cents. And in our savings account, we have to have two accounts uh, twenty five dollars and five cents. Uh, so we, 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 we haven't spent very much money other than the paying for the, uh, the insurance bill. Um, we, we really haven't, we haven't spent anything yet. Um, we have, we, we have the 2000, the $240,000 grant that should be coming due pretty soon. I just want to bring that up only because that, that money is obligated for specific purposes. So that is not going to be for our operating revenue nor for our um, build out construction other than for the area that is targeted for. And it, it we need to have the uh, folks served from that money by the end of December. So there is, there is a deadline, there's the clawback, there's all that business. Um, so I, I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, despite the uh, wonderful information from Ken, we're still moving forward on the on the veto loan. Uh, would be a wonderful thing if we didn't need it, but we can always pay it back fast with grant money if we do. <laughs> um, but anyhow, we're 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 moving forward on the veto loan. There are a number of things that you'll hear about tonight, particularly the MOU with WEC. Um, we we need to get our our work plan and our fin uh, financial projections coordinated for that, uh, and we're on the path for that. Um, the, the last thing I, I would like to bring up is we we did get a we did get a uh, an invoice that I had mentioned earlier from our bookkeeper. It's the first invoice that she has sent us, and that invoice is for four hundred and ninety six dollars. And I would well I can't make a motion, but I would like someone to make a motion if we could uh, please approve that that invoice in tonight's meeting so that we can uh we can get her paid she's been doing good work for us so moved second okay it's a move moved by chuck seconded by siobhan so 496 dollars for the, the bookkeeper and uh jerry could you just send that invoice out to the whole board at some point oh sure i i, I had sent it to you jeremy but i'll send it out to the oh. to the full board no I, problem I, I'm sorry, I must have, I, I would have forwarded that on. I, things slipping through the cracks, I guess. Uh, right. Any any questions about this? No, no, no. Uh, Tom? Is this something that, I mean, it's gonna be a recurring fee that we can move into the consent agenda? And, and, and it would have been on the consent agenda if the if the agenda hadn't sort of crossed the, yeah, the, the, the ether webs about the same time Jerry got the invoice itself. 
for for sure, Chuck. Right, right. And I would like to bring up one more. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that that this wasn't in the uh, consent agenda. I I apologize. There's also a um, there's also an invoice for clerk services from Jeremy Matt from January and February. Um, at $150 a month for a total of $300. I would also like to see that uh, move forward and with this meeting so that so, we can get Jeremy paid. So, so can we friendly amend the previous motion, Chuck and Siobhan, to include yep. the $300 for Jeremy Matt? Okay, that's that's approved. We don't have to make another another motion. Uh, anything else about paying the bookkeeper 496 and paying Jeremy Matt for clerk services for 300? I just do have a question. Is uh, 496 going to be kind of the ongoing ballpark amount that she costs, or, or was that a bunch of upfront costs and it's going to sort of settle out a little bit lower than that? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Uh, it'll be less than that because that that was for all of the work that she had to do to uh, reconcile 2020 and to get all those 1099s out on time for 2020. Uh, so her her carrying costs, if you will, from month to month will be substantially less than that. Um, but I suspect that at the end of the year or the beginning of the next year, um, you know, it'll it'll be a, a, a larger number again for this uh, for this reason. Thank you. Because we have to get those 1099s out. Okay, Jeremy. So um, just a quick question for Jerry. Uh, you pointed out that you were not able to find a check for the $300, $320 invoice that I sent prior to this current one. Is that included in right. this? Okay. No, okay. no, it's not. That was approved in the January 14th or January oh, 12th right. meeting. Must have been the 12th. Right. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. Right. Thank you. Okay. Oh, that's fine. So that that was that was approved, but not paid, as far as I can tell. I I don't believe I wrote that check. I mean, I could I can look back here. Actually, it's right here. Let's see. No, it 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 it, it certainly hasn't been through the banking system. No. <clears throat> so, we will uh, include both uh, both of those amounts, Jeremy, and so that should be coming soonish. Okay. No worries. Okay, any further discussion on these two bills, 496 and 300? Okay, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. abstentions or roll call requests? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Uh, anything else, Jerry? No, I'm good, thank you. All right, thanks, Jerry. Uh, clerk's report, Jeremy? So, I've been working a little bit on trying to get the minutes straightened out. I got a large dump of about 100 files from Becca, and most of those are filling in gaps in our various committee minutes, which is fantastic. Um, it's going to be a chunk of work to go through, organize, clean up, get them on the website, etc. cetera. Um, but I'll be working on that. Um, I did check through, there were a few holes filled in in the governing board minutes, but we are still missing minutes from five meetings, I believe. And there is one meeting where we have no minutes, we have no notes that anyone has been able to find, and we have no recording. So if you wouldn't mind taking a peek through your emails and just check to see if you have any of those missing minutes, I sent out an email uh, maybe a week ago, uh, a few days or a week ago about this. Um, that's my report. Siobhan? I just wanted to say that it seems curious that they're all clustered in the tape same time area. And I think that's when we had the delegate who was writing them out longhand taking the minutes. She took over for Becca. I can't remember her name. Is that Susan? Su Susan. And so I'm wondering if that's why we have that cluster that they might be handwritten and passed out on paper and not on computer anywhere. That's an interesting. That's an interesting idea. That prob probably explains it. Um, we could reach out. Certainly, reach out to her. 
and see if she has any, any records of it or if she transcribed them or if she has the physical copies still. Um, that, that could be worthwhile. It would certainly be helpful. It would be quicker to work off notes than try to go back and listen to the Oracle recordings. Yeah, I think it um, was it Susan Martin. Yeah, I believe. Okay, from uh, Woodbury, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, Jeremy, if you still have her email address, if you want to try try her and see if she's uh, if she's in possession of any of these, that might be that might be good. Okay, I will. That's that's a good thought, Siobhan. Thank you. Um, and I will I will do that. And uh, let's see. I'm not sure I do have her email, though. I uh, didn't uh, when I just checked email. So, Jeremy, I'll send it to you. Email. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Chuck. All right, that's all I had. All right. So, um, let's see. Moving along, um, the Planning and Development Committee report back. David, this is yours. Sure. So, there's quite a few things here, and I'll try to be as efficient as I can. Um, the poll inventory status. Um, we received 16 RFPs. Uh, we have now narrowed it, the group, which is Jeremy, Matt, Ray, out there, and um, Jerry. Am uh, I missing them? Oh, Jerry, Jim, and myself. And we got it down to four. And now we're preparing questions to go out to those four consultants so we can get some clarification on what they actually said about some of the things. But we got some pretty high quality material, I believe. Um, the next item that I want to discuss uh, from the committee is we've been working on a, an MOU with WEC regarding what our agreement will be with them as they go to borrow the $22 million and need some sort of commitment from us pretty soon on committing to paying, helping them pay the lease. And so you're going to see an, an item later on about getting some money for a lawyer to help us with that. Um, but it's moving on pretty good. Um, there, we, there's a meeting tomorrow with Ray, myself, and WEC committee on this um, at 10 a.m., 9 a.m. tomorrow morning for two hours, and we'll see how far we progress with that. The board wants to take motion action on their loan proceed process by the end of the month. So there's, they've got some urgency in our moving along, too. So they're, um, that's where that one's at. The next item is the Velco WEC fiber line from East Montpelier substation to Maple Conda substation, which will be um, a distribute be a line that we can tap into for over 100 people. Um, that's moving along, and I'm trying to recommend that we do a letter of support to Velco and WEC to you know urge them on along with that project, the project we wouldn't have to pay for. Um, it's about eight and a half miles. Um, and then the next thing on, from us is the um, the possible joint EC fiber, CV fiber grant application with WEC to do a generalized high-level design for the whole WEC network, which we have to make high-level design for our whole network. But it would be it's important if we can find the money to do that. So I have, don't have anything right now because there's no money to even apply for, but. Um, that's something that might come down the pike. That's sort of my report. Um, David? Yes. When when would that money be necessary, do you think? The uh, high low design, uh, it, the sooner the better. <laughs> the, the next month. Okay. Yeah. And we'd be sharing the cost. I mean, it wouldn't be all our uh, contribution. Um, so. They have, we have a proposal from Fibersmith, I believe, to do it for $180,000. Um, so that's my report. I think on the next, are there any other questions on my report? Henry. Nope, sorry. I shouldn't be doing anything. Yes. Is that considered middle mile fiber? The which one? The, the, the line from Montpelier to Callis, or well, if if middle mile is defined by something you can take drops off of, yes. If it's a distribution fiber, basically, um, Velcro is going to keep half of the 144 fibers, and WEC is going to get the 72 out of the 144, and WEC needs one tube of that, which leaves 48 for us. 
So that should be more than adequate for our needs for yes. going north. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for David about uh, the information he's presented and not related to the our action items that are imminent? Okay. Let's uh, continue along. Um, but do you want to do the uh, EC Fiber Valley, the Northfield MOU, David? Do that first. Uh, sure. Um, basically, uh, late, you know, uh, I think on Friday, I got word from EC from Valley that EC Fiber was saying yes, they could do it by the end of December. Um, but what they want to do in this is we we have to be fairly careful on how we craft this MOU. They want to build it, and um, basically, they will they will become EC Fiber customers until such time we had an ISP, and we could transfer the ownership and the the customers over to us, because they don't see any way that <laughs> they don't really have another way of doing it. Actually, I guess so. Crafting this MOU that explains all that is what's helped, and I this is going to come up again. I don't feel like I'm in the person that should be drafting MOUs. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not. I um, tend to like to make things too skinny, and I probably need more detail than I tend to want to put into something. But anyway, I'm looking for the executive committee, finance committee, maybe to take on that task, and I can send over a draft of what I've been working on. Um, the um, that's all I know at this point. I think there's, you know, in terms of. The funding, you know, giving the money. I don't want to give them the money until we have, you know, this sort of closed. Um, but we have the money according to the extension that we received this week, right, Jeremy? I I, I haven't seen it yet, but it's going it to be in my mail mailbox eventually. It was, in your, it was in your mailbox. It should have been there. Huh. Okay. okay. I haven't seen it. Anyway, that needs to be done, and I'll look, I'll I'll discuss with that uh, discuss with those people later. Um, but yeah, that's the status on that that particular thing, and and I know Jeremy, you've had some conversations with um, ValleyNet on this, and so it looks like both of them had to agree to do this somehow. So that's the way it came. That's the way it is right now. Yeah, it's a total of, a total of um, about fifty houses that are being passed in the two towns. So. It'd be nice to be able to broadcast something soon. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I think it's mostly Roscoe. It's into Northfield, right? Yeah. Yep. So that's that one. Uh, any other questions on this one before I let Ray talk about the whole inventory for phase one? Oh, so, so, Jeremy. So, so was this actually, was this an action item? Did we want to actually send this somewhere? Um, well, here, I can put a motion in the... Uh, I got two motions I'm pasting in the uh, in the um, chat box. Okay, so I made a motion. The executive and finance committee is directed to execute an agreement with EC Fiber ValleyNet to provide FDPP in Northfield and Roxbury, as described in our CARES grant agreement with the Department of Public Service. Okay, I will second that to um, continue with, with the discussion. Um, can we choose one of those committees so that we're not sort of too many cooks in the kitchen? I'm happy uh, with All right, so uh, go ahead, Chuck. Process wise, the executive committee doesn't technically exist yet. So I don't know if that means we need to like table it if that's where we want it to go. Well, it exists, it exists by statute. So, oh, okay, great, fantastic. Use me. So I'm I'm happy to go either way. Other finance committee members or executive committee members, please uh, please pipe up now. Jeremy, yeah, right. I, I think what I'd say here is that um, I think that it might be appropriate for the finance committee to make a recommendation to the executive committee, and perhaps if we took a first cut at it and then send it to you, because it's calling now, for example, uh, to uh, execute an agreement. And I, and I think we need to put something together first that, that um, recommends exactly what the terms of that might be. And so if we could modify the motion, um, uh, David, to the um, move that the Finance Committee review 
review and recommend an agreement with UC Fiber Valley to provide FTP to FTP in Northfield and Roxbury, um, as described in the CARES grant agreement with Fire and Public Service. And, and then we'll and then we'll take it from there. So I agree with the uh, friendly amendment, but did Jeremy get that down to change? So we maybe we can keep this simpler, keep the motion as it is, and just leave it with the executive and finance committees to execute this. And we'll say the finance committee takes this first. When you're once you're done with this, hand it off to the executive committee, and then we'll just execute it there. Is that yeah. okay? Uh, more for you. So at least we have the, the spirit of. And this is Jerry. If I could just add in. Yeah. I, I think that's the that, you know that's kind of the process, right? That it goes through the committees before it gets to the executive committee for execution. I think that's a if we can maintain that process, I think that will serve as well. Okay. Any other thoughts on this motion? Okay. Uh, all in favor of? Uh, okay, Michael, just in. <laughs> um, just. Just to say that um, Kingdom Fiber and Annie K Broadband are entering into an MOU in a, in a similar vein. Um, and I would be glad to consult with the Finance Committee as to some of the terms that we're working on that might be useful for this one. I think that'd be extremely valuable. Very, very much appreciated. Okay. Any Anything else on this before we take a vote? Henry? Yeah, there had been um, mention of Kingdom Fiber being involved in this. Um, okay, all right. <laughs> I, I assume that's been um, worked out, so I don't need to uh, pursue that line of questioning any further, I guess. So so for, for this, this particular project doesn't involve Kingdom Fiber at all? It's just too far. Oh, okay. Thank you. It's by agreement with Valina and UC Carter. And that was okay. and that was how it was proposed in the grant in the first place. Anyways, it was going to be with them down there because they had the capacity to actually do the to do oh, the work. Wait. Oh, wait. Sorry, uh, miscommunication. Um, in terms of the um, joint venture to do the pre-engineering, uh, I, uh, I had, hadn't heard Kingdom Fiber involved in that, and there had been discussion about them being involved in that. So that true. is that clear? Um, Perhaps, but that's not the motion on the table right now. We're really just sorry, talking about right. a, a, approving <laughs> for the Roxbury Northfield project. So I just, we want to get and that out the door. opportunity, Doug, proceed. Well, so so there there may be another chance to to talk about this in in a, in a bit, but let's let's nail this down first. Anything else about Northfield Roxbury MOU with Valleynet EC Fiber? Okay, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions or roll call requests? Okay, motion passes unanimously. <laughs> Moving forward, that feels really good. Um, poll inventory for phase one, David. Uh, Ray is going to present this. Okay. Um, let's see here. Is Sorry, there... hold, on, hold on. Sorry, I'm, I'm confused. Um, David actually pasted two motions to yeah, that, the chat. The second motion hasn't come up yet. You'll get to it. Okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, David was talking about the process, uh, or talking about the polls inventory results that we're having. And um, as a result of that, the expectation is that in April, um, the CV5 will be in a position to actually bid out phase one uh, for the polls inventory work. Um, and so, once that bid, those bids come in, uh, we can obviously, the board will be, make a decision with regard to whom to award the uh, contract to, for example, and we're going forward. But we have to include within that uh, in within that uh, request for bids is the definition of phase one. And so at this point, the planning and development committee is making a recommendation to the board that, uh, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to paste this in here, and uh, it's going to seem a little 
less precise than perhaps you might have thought, but here we go. Uh, the Planning and Development Committee recommends the board approve phase one is consisting of 127 miles plus or minus. You may recall, that's the motion, you may recall that we've had discussions in the past about um, identifying with specificity in a public meeting exactly what those what those consisted of. And what I can tell you is that uh, this 127 miles consists of the uh, number one recommendation and the feasibility study and the adjoining uh, adjoining service groups. So together they consist of 127 miles uh, plus or minus. And this is what we would like the board to approve. And then when the R the request for bids go out, the actual definition of that will be made available to them so they can make an appropriate bid. Um, so is there a is there a motion to approve and a second and then discussion? Well, so I'm gonna take this Ray as you moving it. So okay. is there a second for this? Second. Okay. So um I actually saw RD raise his hand first before you said it, Siobhan. So I'm gonna give RD a chance to, to, to second that one for you. Or was that not a second, RD? Okay. All right, he's he's got a, he's got a chance this time. Okay, so moved by Ray, seconded by RD. Any further discussion of this? Okay, that's that's encouraging. We, we we're gonna get done in time. I, I feel it. I feel it in my bones. All right. All those in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions, or roll call requests? Motion passes unanimously. We have a phase one poll inventory. Oh, no, no, Jeremy, Jeremy, I abstain. Okay. Michael is going to abstain, so if we can have the record showing that, that would be, that would be good. Okay. Anything else on um, poll inventory for phase one, Ray? No, that's it. Okay, very good. Moving along, funding legal assistance for the WEC and CB Fiber MOU. David, it's back to you. Yes, so the Planning Development Committee was discussing this last week and we decided that we really needed some help with drafting it. The, the uh, lawyer, WEC's lawyer sent us a draft MOU based on their interpretation of how it ought to work with all the partners. We took a look at it and said, you know, we need to make this a little, little tighter for us. And having heard Krista Shute speak at the Vicuda meeting last week, I was convinced she was the person we needed to help with this. So I reached out to her last week and she's agreed to help us um, uh, edit this MOU that we got from WEC. And so proposing uh, the motion that I put in the um, for those who don't know Krista Shoot, she used to be work as a uh, business person for the Vermont Telecommunications Authority back in the day. She's now a, um, oh, she's a lawyer who basically works for the state of New Hampshire. Um, but she does, she's been consulting with um, Annie Key Broadband, and I think she lives in Crossbury. She has a history with Crossbury, and she's dynamite. Anyway, so. I'd like to make a motion that CD5 retain Krista Shoot for an amount not to exceed $2,000 to provide legal services regarding negotiating an MOU with Washington Electric Co op regarding the leasing of fiber in all their territory in CD fiber communities. Second. Okay. okay. Moved by David, seconded by Ray. Any further discussion of this? Any questions for David about this? So I don't see any questions. I'd also like to, you know, throw my endorsement behind Krista. She gave a presentation at that Bakuda meeting, and uh, yeah, she she knows the story, um, and she's w well poised. It's not the sort of thing that we're going to have to explain stuff. She's going to know what she's going to know what's what. So I I feel I feel extremely comfortable moving forward with this. Um, anybody else before we vote? Okay, great. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Opposed abstentions or roll call requests? Motion passes unanimously. Very good. Still moving forward. Okay. Um, let's go to the adoption of the Finance and Audit Committee Charter. All of you would have uh, 
received a copy of this from me and possibly earlier uh, weighing in as uh, Ray has drafted it. It's come out of the Finance and Audit Committee and as far as we can tell is ready for, um, is ready to go. And I think Ray just posted it in the chat. It's long, but it's there. Um, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be too, too surprising. I'd like Any? to move the, uh, move the adoption of the Finance and Audit Committee Charter. Second. Okay. Okay, moved by Ray, seconded by Chuck. Any further discussion or questions? RD, I'm going to unmute you because you're, you're, I was getting some feedback from your, hold on a second, some feedback from your phone line, so go ahead. Are you there? Can you hear me? I, I can. I'm, I'm going to mute one or the other. Okay. Okay. Mute my video. Mute my, uh, my, my, uh, my, uh, my phone on. Perfect. Okay. Um, I have two questions. So first of all, um, the, in the, um, the charter makes no uh, provision for voting procedures. And since volunteers are being invited to participate in the committee, subject to committee vetting, um, will they be voting members of the committee? Uh, good question. I think that um, uh, once they become members, I think that they are voting members of the committee. Okay. Um, you, uh, I don't know if it's necessary um, to make that clear in the charter, but thank you. Um, on second of all, um, it shouldn't the um, shouldn't the committee be reporting to the treasurer? Isn't the treasurer doesn't the treasurer bear um, not ultimate but at least penultimate responsibility? the organization's finances. So shouldn't the, shouldn't the committee be reporting to the treasurer? So um, the, uh, the treasurer's responsibilities are laid out in the statutes and they're really quite extensive. Uh, but the Finance Audit Committee oversees the work of the treasurer. Okay, I understand. I understand. Um, and, and the treasurer is not, the treasurer in addition is not a member of the board. Oh, all right. I understand. Thank you. That answers my question. All right. And I, I can also point out that vote that whether or not the members of the public are voting members can be decided by this board when they get appointed. Because those members are appointed by us here, not by members of the of that committee. So, uh, I see Tom Fisher and then Chuck. Yeah, you can say what I was gonna say. Okay. Wonderful. Chuck. Um I wonder if the treasurer is uh, uh, subject to the committee, is it appropriate for the treasurer to also be on the committee? I think the treasurer is on the committee. Um, so so are, is the question whether it's appropriate for them to be on the committee if there's oversight involved? Right, yeah, I guess does that generate some sort of conflict? Maybe. So, the treasurer, maybe I can. Could the treasurer be an ex officio member? Okay, so so hold on. Let's let's do um, let's let's have Jerry weigh in, and then Ken, and then Jeremy. Okay. So the first thing I want to say is we're getting some odd feedback from some somebody. So if you can mute yourself, if you're not. Speaking, that would be appreciated. All right, that was that's um, called caller so, three. I'm do, doing that now. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and I'm sure Jeremy, Matt, thanks you. <laughs> uh, no, I I think the um, th there there would be situations where the uh, the treasurer would have to abstain from voting. Um, it it it. It may be the case that as ex officio, the treasurer doesn't have a vote, but is a member of the committee. I, you know, I, I could see either one of those, either one of those working, but I think the, the treasurer needs to be a, an integral part of the finance committee. Uh, some, I think, I think the voting for the treasurer is appropriate, but I think there are also times when the treasurer needs to abstain. 
that, that's fine. Fair enough. I've got um, Jeremy, Matt, then Ken, then Siobhan. So I, I was just going to say, in, in terms of uh, volunteers voting, I would personally think that it would be a good idea to give volunteers a vote on committees. I mean, the ultimately the governing board is going to decide on these things, um, but it makes people feel more engaged with what they're working on if they're able to vote on it. Um, so, I mean, I, I think we'd be more likely to get volunteers that would help out if we weren't excluding them from voting. Fair enough. So I have Ken, then Siobhan, then uh, myself. Yeah, I'll just re restate it. I think um, having the treasurer be an ex officio member seems consistent with the role to me. Okay. Siobhan? When the Finance Committee was originally constituted and Rama was the chair, we had this discussion. It was determined that the treasurer was serving ex officio and did not have a vote. Okay, that's easy enough. So um, that all seems reasonable. I don't know if that's in, encompassed well enough within the uh, the charter as it stands. There was another another question that came up, and that was how the chair uh, the chairs of committees are selected. The way that that's been done in the past is when the committee was constituted and people were added or subtracted. Um, that this board actually delegated a chair rather than the chair being elected from the the members of the body itself. So um, Ray was elected in a committee meeting, and that, I, I don't think there's any problem with that. And but the motion was that that was going to be um, temporary, like or provisional. I, I remember the wording until May when we have a reorganization. So I would propose not that we have to have a motion here or anything, but I would propose then that we. Um, we, as an entire board, reappoint the chair or appoint the chair uh, when we reorganize in May, if that's amenable to everybody. And then, uh, Jeremy. Um, so I'm pretty sure that the statute as written says that the Finance Committee will own its chair um, and vice chair. So if that is not how the board is doing it, then the um, but I think the charter needs to be edited to say that the chair, vice chair, will be appointed by the entire board. So, can you find where it says that? I'm, I'm not. I didn't realize that that was in statute. Uh, no, I. Um, I'm sorry. I, I seem to recall when I was reading over it. Am, am I wrong about that, Ray? Yeah, I don't think there's any mention in the, in the statute with regard to uh, the election of uh, the selection of chairs of, uh, for committees. No, I'm not talking about the statute. I'm talking about in the charter. Oh, within, the, within the charter, there's no mention at all with regard to the, the selection of chair or vice chair. Okay, it's never mind. I'm sorry. I've, I've got too much on my mind right now. I'm getting stuck in my work. And, <laughs> and I'm open to the friendly amendment that says members. Membership shall include the treasurer, uh, uh, parents, um, ex officio, closed parents, um, if the second is also available to them. So, who is the second on that? Is that Chuck, is that okay to add treasurer ex officio? Great. Yes. All right. Michael? Uh, I just wanted to um, backtrack quickly. Uh, Jeremy, um, I think. All volunteer members of committees should have votes, um, with the exception of the treasurer, and the reason being that the treasurer is overseen by the committee that he or she is sitting on in ex officio. Sounds good. Any anything else on this with the uh, the recently amended charter? Okay, it looks like we're we're at consensus. So uh, let's vote then. Um, the motion to approve the, the charter for the Finance and Audit Committee with the uh, previously noted amendment for the treasurer being ex officio member. Um, please signify your support by saying aye. 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 
Uh, opposed abstentions or roll call requests? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Um, policy charter. We have a policy so, committee charter as well. Just a clarification on the uh, friendly amendment. Was that ex officio without a vote? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just want to make sure. Thank you. Okay. So policy charter, um, you all should have had a copy of this as well. Um, I will move that we adopt the, uh, the charter for the policy committee as presented. Second. Okay, seconded by Phil. Any further discussion? Siobhan? I don't think the policy committee needs to meet every month. I think it needs to meet on an as needed basis. That was changed. Oh, was, was it? Yeah. Um, oh, then I must be looking at an old one. I'm sorry. I didn't recirculate it, but uh, uh -huh. yeah, uh, Ray was doing the drafting on that, and because of the the nature of the work of the policy committee, it's it's really kind of intermittent. So um, we changed it to not have a set meeting date uh, or reporting on a monthly basis, but to do that as an uh, as needed basis. So otherwise, it's very much in line with the template okay. that we just saw. Yeah, that was okay. It's yeah. the one I was looking at had it, so okay. I see it here earlier. Right. Okay. Good question. Uh, anything else about the policy committee? Tom? Um, so the, the charter notes that they will uh, uh, put forward or you know create and put forward policies. Do we have anything related to um, Making sure we're following our policy, you know, being present at the main board meeting or, or speaking up when something is over a certain price amount or whatever. Or is that just something we're going to watch on our own to try to stay above on? That's a good question. Um, we kind of have to be very self policing about that. Um, and if we see ourselves moving away from something, to jump in. I mean, we have. We have talked about having an annual review, um, and if we're seeing that we're not following, uh, I guess we have to ask ourselves the question of are we just not policing ourselves, or has practice really deviated from the policy and the policy needs revision at that time? But um, we don't have a policy watchdog per se. Right. I mean, we can continue to use the policy as a, a sort of a touchstone. I think, like Phil said, you know, as we, if if we seem to be going far afield, it's, it makes it easy for someone to say, well, wait a minute, this this isn't what we agreed to. But uh, I mean, we could always ask the uh, the state ethics officer to uh, to help us with that. I, I was not trying to create a police force. I was thinking more about the fact that we have you know forty members and alternates, and we have you know five different committees going and lots of activity, and just want to make sure we're all yeah. on the same page. Yeah. So, so I, we, we could appoint Tom Fisher as the uh, as the <laughs> That's uh, an idea. Yeah. as the, uh, the the policy officer, policy police officer, or something. Get like a that. badge. I, 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 will, I will personally make you a badge. Yes, you get a badge. Go ahead, Alan. Yeah, I'm going to say Tom is sort of taking on that role. He was the one who got us to look up all the policies and. Uh, get them, get them collected at one point. There are a heck of a lot of them. So, I mean, almost anybody could become this police officer without a lot of training, I think. So, uh, I, I, I think we're kind of set. We just have to police ourselves. And I think Tom is probably going to tell us when we've gotten off the path. <laughs> All right, M Michael, then back to Tom. Um, I, I think Sheriff Tom should put together a packet of all the policies as passed throughout the time that we've existed and present such packet to every new delegate or alternate delegate who arrives to our board and that should do it. <laughs> All right, Tom, it sounds like you've been voluntold. Do you want do you have anything else you want to say before you uh, take on this weighty responsibility? Be careful what you wish for. Uh, <laughs> No, but I, in all seriousness, I mean, um, 
I mean, I don't know enough about the statutes and everything else. I'm thinking, you know, I don't know what the best solution is here. I really don't think it's somebody policing everybody else that, that is not gonna make anybody feel friendly. Um, but at the same time, I mean, do we have a, a method in place or, or something to think about? And we don't need to sit on this tonight. We're gonna waste more time. We have a long agenda tonight. Um, but just something to think about. There are a lot of moving pieces and we don't want to make stupid mistakes that end up costing us down the line. Sure. So the stupid mistakes that we make when we violate our own policy, those are self-inflicted wounds and they're also self-healing wounds. I mean, that's that's on us. When we violate statute, that's much more serious. And that's something that I would say it behooves all of us to to read the statute. There's actually it's there's actually not that much there, thankfully. Um, but in terms of what our obligations are, it's pretty clear. Um, but there's a fair bit of leeway in exactly how we how we get to operate and how we choose to to do things. That it's not likely that we're going to trip over we're not going to trip over anything I illegal. Probably um, one one of us is likely to catch it and to to call it out. And it's you know partially my job and partially the the various uh, committee chairs' jobs to make sure that we're doing things on the straight and narrow when it comes to public records, open meetings, laws, and that sort of thing, and, and the clerk also. Alan? And I, I think it's fair to say that Jeremy Hansen is very receptive when people point out that maybe this is a violation of, of statute. I mean, it's it's not something we take personally. We just try to make sure that everybody is doing what, what is required of us, and we're working together on that. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Anything else about the policy committee charter? The great thing about these charters is, is if it turns out later that it's they're deficient or too much, we can we can modify them again. So, all right, I think we're ready to vote. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Opposed abstentions. Roll call requests. Motion passes unanimously. Thanks, everybody. Uh, moving on to the um, Finance and Audit Committee call for volunteers. Um, and there was some, so I, I will hand this off to you, Ray, in a second, but there was some question about whether we actually needed board action to do this or whether this was sort of our kind of default posture is that if we find volunteers and they want to serve, hey, let's let's bring them in. I've long since long advocated when I talk to people, they're like, well, how can I help? I like, well, you can donate. Uh, when we're ready, we're, we're happy to have you loan us money, you can pre-subscribe when we're ready for that, or you can join one of our fine committees. Um, so I'll hand this back to you then, Ray. Yeah, so it, the, the purpose of this was uh, to several fold, I think, but in a couple come to, to mind immediately. One is it sets up a process uh, by which we actually solicit and we're looking for people with subject matter expertise. Okay, I mean, that's a that's a different thing than somebody wanted to, you know, hey, listen, I'm really interested in this stuff and I'd like to help if I can. Uh, no, I don't have any expertise in anything, but I'm, I'm happy to help. We, we need people who have GIS background, project management background, legal backgrounds, accounting backgrounds. And those are the kinds of folks I think we're looking for trying to solicit here. Um, and the other is this sets up a process. The process being that when people have an expression of interest that that expression of interest actually goes to the committee and the committee reviews the people's uh, uh, expressions of interest and their backgrounds and things and then makes a recommendation to the board for the board appointments and so uh, i think that this has value for at least those two reasons and i would commend this to you i think we've already done this for pdc i think we've already done it for the communications committee this is the one for the finance and audit committee and I know that uh, the policy committee has something in the queue. Uh, it apparently isn't available tonight. But um, and so I would I'd, uh, move the adoption of this by the board and look for a second. Second, David Healy. Okay, so moved by Ray, seconded by David. Um, this, and so again, this seems to me the sort of thing that that a chair of a committee can probably just do on their own. So I'm I'm, I'm happy to make this a formal motion and, and approve this and all, but. I should. I would hope that chairs feel like if we wanted to seek out additional help through whatever means, that that's certainly not um, bumping up against any sort of you know, power structure that the governing board holds. So, 
yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely voting yes on this. So I see Phil and then RD and then Chuck. Uh, yeah, I mean, Ray and I have been back and forth on this, and I've kind of played uh, the antagonist in this, and that my sense was it, it wasn't, it was, it's a process piece, and it, it ought to be up to the committee. Um, but, uh, and again, with some of the correspondence I had with John Morris, he said, what's the harm? And I, I agree with him. It's not, you know, uh, it's not a big, you know, thing either way. I just didn't feel that we needed to do it. I agree more with the idea that it, the, the, the chair and the committee itself can do that. But, you know, I'm not necessarily going to vote no. Okay. Thanks, Phil. Uh, RD? I'm not hearing you through your phone anymore. There we are. You can hear me now? Yep, you're good. Got it. Um, considering that members of the, uh, the committee are going to have access to some sensitive material, it seems reasonable to have some level of vetting for volunteers for the Finance and Audit Committee. So I think, it's, I think the motion, um, the proposal is appropriate in referring uh, expressions of interest uh, um, for review. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Chuck? Um, I'm going to disagree with that. Uh, we're, not, we're not talking about delegating the authority to appoint further members to the committee. Anybody who volunteers in this capacity is going to simply be someone who is given a task by that committee. Uh, and I think it should be left up to the wherewithal of committees to, you know, figure out how to engage and delegate appropriately. And certainly uh, a volunteer of this capacity, the committee is going to need to decide what information is appropriate and relevant to give that volunteer in order to uh, do their job, um, and, and certainly there could be scenarios where perhaps an NDA is required because there are sensitive materials required, um, but I don't think we as a board should be in the business of, turn, of saying no to volunteers that any committee uh, might put out. But what I do see here as, as uh, process-wise valuable um, is you know the the call for uh, uh, volunteers, um, and I think based on the authority already delegated to the communications committee, that matter could theoretically be taken up by the communications committee. It's certainly, more than welcome to be taken up here as well. Uh, but I think that could have also been taken simply as a communications committee uh, item to uh, help make that call occur. Uh, just my two cents. All right, thanks, Chuck, Jeremy, and Michael. Um, so just one thing to point out, um, the, this, or the motion that, or the, what Ray posted, is that uh, volunteers will be recommended for appointment to the committee as committee members. So, you know, they would then be voting members of the committee. You know, the, the way that you were saying it made it sound more like we were just saying, like, Oh, hey, you know, Mr. CPA, can you look over these documents for us? Which is a little bit different than being uh, a voting member of the committee as well. I mean, I'm, I'm fine. I, I think it's good that they're on, but anyways. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Uh, so, Michael and Alan. Um, I, I like something that already said. And the fact is that all of us at different times in committee work and on the board um, come in to contact with sensitive information that belongs to CD fiber and needs to be protected. As a board, we go into executive session to protect some of it from the public record. Um, as committees, we can do the same thing. But all of us have the knowledge of some sensitive information by having read certain reports and studies and, and knowing plans. And 
we function very well and have for a long time uh, a high honor system where we all generally have a sense of what we can say out in public and what we can't. But maybe the policy committee could be charged to develop some kind of policy that includes a general NDA that we all sign that de determines the kinds of things that we need to protect to protect the CUD. So I know it's a little off topic, but I, I, it, the idea is struck and I think we might want to talk about it. I know we can put it in the next meeting if you want because of the agenda. No, I, I think let's just kick it over to the policy committee. So Phil, if you could um, just chew on that with uh, your folks a little bit. Um, I'm gonna go on to Alan and Jeremy next. I'm gonna step away for just one second. So we have to remember that anybody who is on a committee, a member of a committee is a public official and is therefore subject to all the provisions of the open meeting law and also to access to public records. So we don't have to reinvent all those safeguards that are in there about non-disclosure agreements and all that other stuff. What we do need is to make sure that when members come on a committee, they realize what our policies and our rules and regulations and so forth are, but that's already in place. We just have to make sure that people are familiar with it and they understand their responsibilities. And I think that anybody who has served on a, on a committee, a, a public committee or a public board or whatever, realizes that that's the case. Ray, I had one question of you. I just want to make sure that I have straight in my mind what this call actually does. There's nothing obligatory in the call. It is simply advisory. Is that correct? Um, that's correct in the sense that, um, you know, the, the call goes out. If people have an expression of interest, you know, the, the, the link, as I envisioned it and I sent out what I thought might have been an appropriate call, subject to each committee's um, tweaking of, the, of it, that um, if you're interested in the finance and audit committee, we're interested in this, these subject matter experts and other things as cited in our charter, here's the link to the charter and here's our email address if you are interested. And um, yeah, so, and we get those expressions of interest and sift through those, maybe talk and interview some folks and then the finance and audit committee makes a recommendation to the board for the board to make the appointments. That would be the process. Or, or make no appointments. We, we could go through all of that and decide that um, there isn't anyone there that could add the value that we're looking for, for example. I'm, I'm glad you explained that tonight because I actually, when I read this, thought exactly the opposite, that we just wanted to get more people on, on committees. And um, I, I was thinking, oh my gosh, no, that's not what we need. We really need to target the skills we need and find people who can fill those positions and help us out. So if that's the intent, I understand that now, and hopefully others will as well. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, Jeremy. Uh, nothing. Okay. Any other uh, any other thoughts about the call for volunteers from the finance committee? Does your hand go up, David? Nope. No? Okay. Okay, there's a motion on the table. So to approve this uh, call for volunteers, um, please signify your support by saying oh. aye. There's a uh, motion on the floor, not the table. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Right. That's all I'm doing. I mean, I just... We have a new shirt for them. <laughs> it must have, fallen off, must have fallen off the table onto the floor then, and I didn't notice. <laughs> Aye. Okay, so a bunch of, so signify your support by saying aye. 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 Opposed abstentions, uh, roll call requests. Okay, motion passes unanimously. Okay, moving along to the executive committee charter. I'm going to hand this back to you, Ray, and I want to I want to point out that this was something that like we had agreed to or set set up or like tasked Ray with. This was something that was of Ray's own initiative. So uh, why don't you take it away? So you've you've assigned the credit or the blame, right? Thank you. Correct. Yes. <laughs> so um, uh, there is an executive committee, um, but what we haven't done is provide for it 
what we've provided for the other committees. That is, what are the responsibilities and what are the authorities? And kind of delineating um, the board is deciding what's going to happen, but there's some such tremendous detail involved with uh, actually implementing those things. It requires a great deal of coordination. And so the purpose here was to, to uh, part of the executive committee to take those things for action. And so, um, uh, uh, the, so the, I, I passed this up before you've had an opportunity to read it. We've had a lot of feedback. One difference on this is that the membership changed. Uh, I did originally have the treasurer on there. It turns out that the treasurer can't be on there. It has to be members of the board. The treasurer is not a member of the board, for example. And um, I think in an original draft, I also had the, the clerk the clerk on there. Um, but part of the thing here is to keep it as a small as small a group as possible. The chairs are the, are the people who can call their own committees to action and to coordinate uh, between committees. And it felt like they had, uh, they were probably most likely to be the people who had more of the details uh, in their head than uh, perhaps even some members of the committee uh, as being the appropriate people. So um, that's that's this, and I'll, I'll make the motion if there's a second, and then we'll go forward. I'll second it. David. Okay, moved by Ray, seconded by David. Um, I'd like to point out something. So there's a, a question about should the clerk be on the executive committee and the treasurer is ex officio. So uh, it's true statute says um, that the that members of an executive committee shall serve staggered terms and shall be board members. I'll give you your statutory link there. So they shall be board members. That's not uh, so if they're a member, um, they have to be board members. So they could, you know, the treasurer can certainly come to the meeting, but they are not by statute uh, allowed to be on the on the committee um, the, the clerk on the other hand by statute is an officer of the district and probably should be on the executive committee um, the clerk is the uh, delegated custodian of records of the district um, which has other obligations under the, mun the municipality section of uh, state law so I would that would be the only recommendation that I would uh, um, that I would make is that the membership shall include the chair, vice chair, clerk, and committee chairs. Any other any other thoughts on on this charter? I'll accept that as a friendly amendment if David will. I will accept that as a friendly amendment. Jeremy is one more meeting to go to. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, just uh, Jerry and Chuck did note or ask if the treasurer is not an officer. The treasurer is an officer, but cannot be on the executive committee. Okay. Funny. So um, this so this also uh, yeah, Alan, you're probably you're going to ask the question that I'm about to ask. So go ahead. Well, probably not. I, the 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 clerk, by the way, does not have to be a board member. This stuff gets really crazy. Um, the clerk often is a board member, but it doesn't have to be a board member. So you want to remember if you if you put the if you, put, if you say you're going to add the clerk to the executive committee's list, you got to make sure that the clerk is a member of the board because the clerk possibly may not be a member of the board. It's not required by the statute. It's just weird. I think it probably is a good idea to have the clerk as a member of the committee, but there might be times when the clerk cannot actually be a, a, a voting member of the committee, can obviously sit there and take notes and even be part of an executive session if he or she meets the criteria of people other than a board member being included in, in an executive session. And the treasurer can attend executive sessions in the same way. Um, there is specific language you have to meet to show that somebody other than just a board member can be in the executive session. But I, this is just one of those things. I have no idea what the legislators were thinking about when they drafted some of this stuff, but it is the law. And so we just really should make sure we're not making any mistakes. And that's the only reason I'm piping up. I, I, I'm not endorsing most of the stuff, by the way. I think it's really kafui, all, all the regulations. It, it doesn't make sense to me. 
but I'm just trying to say what is required of us. Okay, so I have a couple things to add, and then uh, we'll get to, to Michael. Um, first of all, uh, we should probably be explicit here about who the chair of the executive committee is. Uh, this is the executive committee elected chair, same discussion that we had before. That's what I thought you were going to say, Alan. Um, but so if the chair of the CB Fiber Governing Board is the chair of the executive committee, um, we could probably just state that explicitly there. Um, we could also change the wording, could, could change the wording um, so that it says, shall include the chair, vice chair, the clerk, if they are a member of the governing board, and the committee chairs. Because couldn't it be that the committee chairs might also not be members of the governing board? So, I mean, we could probably put, put that like weasel language in there. I also want to point out something that I, I mentioned. I, I don't know how recently I mentioned this. I certainly mentioned it within the first year of our existence, but because we're a municipality, um, I haven't looked at, at the process or the, the legality, but like other municipalities, I think we have the opportunity to change our charter. Um, so we could change, essentially change the state law as it applies to us by adopting a charter and getting it passed with a vote of the members of our, the various municipalities in our district, and then have the legislature approve or not something that only applies to CB fiber. And Alan, I mean, I saw you smile and raise your hand there. I, 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 th I think it's possible. So we could, we could do whatever we want. Right. It, 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 Jeremy, it's definitely possible, but believe me, you do not want to go through the legislative process of trying to get your own charter change. It's the government operations committees are just, um, they are the very <laughs> definition of, uh, of roadblocks. Um, so I, 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 getting back to your first point in, in, in this part of the conversation, I, I do agree with you. I think it should be stated that the person who is chosen to be chair of the board will also be chair of the executive committee. I mean, I think if, if, if you don't want somebody to be chair of the executive committee, you probably should not be voting for them to be chair when the board does its organization meeting in May. So I think that's the, that's the check on, on who becomes the chair of the executive committee. It's the same person as the chair and that person you're voting on. That's a good point. Uh, Michael. I've added, I've added that language in the chat room. The chair of the governing board should be the chair of the executive committee as a friendly amendment to myself if uh, David uh, supports it as well. I'll support that friendly amendment. Okay. Sounds good. Michael. Okay. So you thought Jeremy Hansen was being silly, but that's exactly what I wanted to say. We might find a, communi a community member who's extremely talented and extremely dedicated and extremely willing to help on one of our committees. And after a period of exemplary work, the committee says, you know, you make the best chair for us. We really could have a non-board member as a chair, a committee chair. Um, and so I think instead of being specific as to different positions, being members of the board, um, I think it should be a blanket statement. I think maybe Jeremy was getting at that in his um, suggestion. Um, and the, the only problem is if, if we um, disregard a non-member chair, then that committee is not represented. And so we would further have to say that the committee would elect a representative to the executive committee. And this is getting all too silly, I think, because we really are doing committee committees. <laughs> but I think that would be the best way to meet the objectives that, that we're talking about right now. Oh, all right. Man. So I see um, Ch uh, Chuck, then Jeremy, but I, I want to put something else out here is that we are, a, we are, even though there's 20 towns, we are a small, agile organization. We don't have to sort of build in every eventuality here. I think if we approve this as it is, get on with our life, and if we come to a situation where we have a committee member who is not a board member and we need to make this work differently, we're gonna, we'll call it something other than the executive committee and we'll redelegate the responsibility there so that we get around statute. We'll figure it out. So there's a lot of what ifs, but I don't think we need to be as rigid as House or Senate GovOps, no offense to their respective chairs. I mean, point of order, I'm sure you meant to say we will find another way to accommodate the statutes. Okay. 
<laughs> yes, but I'm but I'm 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 not, not a lawyer or that diplomatic, but thank you, Alan. You can tell that you were once upon a time the executive director of a well respected organization lobbying in the state house. So <laughs> kudos. Uh, Chuck and then Jeremy. Okay. I was just I was gonna make a very similar suggestion as Michael is to say, why don't we change the language and just say uh, at least one representative from each committee? Okay. Uh, Jeremy. I was just gonna basically agree with with you that maybe we could just kick the can down the road and figure it out if it, if it becomes a problem. Again, like our Vermont legislature, you know, modeling good behavior. <laughs> And Ray. Yes, the, the last uh, last amendment would be the uh, membership shall include the chair, vice chair, committee chairs, and the clerk if a member of the board. And I think that uh, meets uh, the objectives I heard earlier. I'll accept that as a friendly amendment if David does. That doesn't get. Uh, I would not yeah. accept a friendly amendment that was the last thing of making this thing crazily any yeah. member of the committee. No, so, this, no, no, this was in the chat. chat. Okay. I, I agree to that on the minute. Okay. I think we should, we could live with the way it's written. Okay. Any further discussion on this? Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed abstentions or roll call requests. All right. Motion passes unanimously, if not grudgingly. <laughs> Moving along, status of RFPs. Uh, where are the various RFPs? We have uh, we have one for. We talked a bit about the poll inventory. We got a bit a bit of feedback about that. Um, the RFP for the project managers. Can somebody give a report back of that? Yeah, I think I could do that unless David wants to. You can. Uh, so the um, RFP went out on the first of. Um, the 22nd of February, I guess it is now, and uh, the proposals response will be back uh, on the 15th, which is uh, next Monday, and they're being reviewed by members of the PDC, and the recommendations will come forward to the board um, for execution from the PDC. Okay, do you have a sense of the uh, what you're hoping for the turnaround time for that to be, so the 15th? Um, would those be ready in, in time for a March 23rd governing board meeting? Um, I think the answer to that is would be yes. Hope you know, obviously we'd like a good response, right? And mm -hmm. hopefully we can do half a dozen, dozen of these things and identify um, the leading candidates for it and make a recommendation. So it's a matter of getting the um, uh, PDC, the PDC have a meeting between now and the 23rd, which I think David has in mind. Uh, so the short answer is yes. For the 23rd. Very good. Okay. Any uh, so I don't think we have any other RFPs. We heard about the poll inventory, so this should have really been the PM thing. Um, moving along, um, communications committee report, Chuck. Great. Uh, I'll keep this really quick. Um, so as of our last meeting, there were just a couple of things that came out of it. First and foremost, the update that was sent around the board. Uh, so everybody, thank you for sending those on to your respective um, committees. Uh, a process update. We did uh, authorize Tim Sullivan and myself to be kind of the gatekeepers of uh, website changes as they are requested and, and getting them prioritized and being the face uh, in front of our developer. So she has not a single point of content contact, but a single-ish point of contact. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, I did want to just call out that thanks to everybody's uh, due efforts, we were able to uh, collate all of the missing uh, minutes and agendas. And thankfully, we haven't been around as long as some of the other committees, so it was an easier effort on uh, for us, but we now are fully up to date with all of our past agendas and minutes uh, on the website. Um, and that is it for communications this week, unless anybody has any questions or comments. Anything for Chuck? David? Do we have enough money to continue paying our consultant? We, we uh, paid her a retainer in advance, um, to which uh, I don't believe we have used up the number of hours we've discussed. I'll check in with her prior to the next communications 
uh, committee meeting and provide an update. Thank you. Cool. Anything else for Chuck? Great. Thanks for that. Um, clerk step and revisited. This is something that generated a bit of uh, discussion last time around. And the question was, now that we're offloading some of the responsibilities of the clerk's office onto CBRPC and paying them for that, thanks, Christian. Um, what is the um, what is the role of the stipend for the clerk? Should that should that remain? Should that change? Should that be something that um, our esteemed clerk is paid for expenses as you know as invoiced or something? What uh, what say you? Anybody have any thoughts about this? I see Ray. Yeah, I don't. I don't think he was paid enough in the first place. Uh, I know all the work that he's been doing and uh, should have been paid a lot more than was paid. Uh, my view of the world is it's, um, uh, it's really a modest uh, amount of money. Uh, the clerk's role is going to oversee a lot of other work um, as well as maintain the records, et cetera. My view of the world would be to retain at least the current stipend. And so I move that we retain the current stipend. Okay, which doesn't actually require a motion because it's that's exactly how it is right now. Okay. Uh, is any, if anybody has any thoughts that we need need to change or do anything different than what we've done previously, I'm happy to hear about it or any other thoughts, Siobhan? I mean, if the current occupier of the seat doesn't feels strongly enough about it, they could donate it back to the organization, I guess. But I, I do agree that we need to be paying the treasurer and the clerk a stipend. That there was a reason we enacted that in the first place, and that reason didn't stop being valid. And I should also point out that it is perfectly within the within the rights of the clerk or the treasurer to not send an invoice. But I'm I appreciate the work, uh, the ongoing work that lives in both of those positions and would. I mean, most other municipalities of this sort certainly pay their treasurers and clerks more, <laughs> um, if not have full-time jobs for them. I'm thinking, for example, of the uh, small towns, so like Worcester, you know, where Katie does everything that kind of le le leaves laying around. So, uh, Jeremy? Well, I appreciate the kind words, and you know, I, I was more just throwing it out there. Didn't want to, you know, keep taking the site that people thought that it wasn't um, appropriate. Um, they didn't want people to feel like I'd be upset or leave the clerk position if everyone decided that. Well, we're paying CBRPC now, so that that was sort of my um, my aimness for bringing that up. But yeah, just so thanks for the kind words. Thank you. Anything else on this, or are we good as status quo? We're good. I'm seeing status quo. Moving along, uh, Bolton and other potential new towns. Um, I forwarded you an email that um, was from Rob Fish about uh, some of the aid, some of the federal money that's coming down the pike, and some of the state money, for that matter, that's coming down the pike. And his suggestion was that if we're going to get other towns on board, uh, for any other towns into CUDs, we should probably consider doing this fairly soon. So I think his, here's his exact words. I encourage you to get on the agenda now for any towns in your area that are not part of your CUD and have unserved addresses, because that will uh, open up our ability to, to use those federal or state funds to help them. The reason I bolted on here is because I, I talked at length to a volunteer in Bolton, um, not initially about uh, Bolton joining CV Fiber, but somebody who was really dialed in, who's already done a survey um, and reminded me a lot of the work that Henry did in Duxbury before Duxbury joined CV Fiber. Um, um, she has 200, 300 respondents, knows who the people are, what they need, where they are. Um, and is, seems willing to, to do the work. I mean, they are contiguous with us. Uh, it's kind of a Western stretch into Chittenden County, um, but there's no other adjoining CUDs that makes sense 
for them there. Um, so I guess I just wanted to put this out there is, do we want to go, you know, so even knowing that these towns that we're adding at this point are probably not really front burner at this point, because, you know, we're making plans based on feasibility studies that don't include them. Um, what do we do about a, a Bolton or another town? I'm thinking like, not that, you know, folks in the, you know, Matt River Valley necessarily need it, but I'm thinking again, like Waterbury, which I, I kind of got tired of asking Waterbury if they wanted to do anything, so I just kept hearing nothing. But should we, should we consider Bolton? Should we actively move with Waterbury? All right, I see Siobhan, then Ken. I, I think we should go after Bolton and surround Waterbury and, and put pressure on them. <laughs> Come to us, you know you want to join us. Um, I know people who live in Waterbury who want to join, um, but not enough to actually go to a meeting and say that. So there's well, that. I, I'm perfectly willing to go and talk to talk to a select board. All you need is somebody from Waterbury to get me on the agenda. I mean, I have a can presentation. I can talk select board talk, and doesn't matter conservative or left leaning or whatever. They generally understand the value, and we're coming to the table at this point. We're coming to the table with a lot. So um, the question here, though, is that is this something that we want to do? You know, what about Huntington? That's right next door. What about Buell's Gore? What about the Mad River Valley? The rest of you know, Washington County. Um, so I see Ken and then Tom and Michael. Yeah, do, do, uh, does indeed Bolton share a boundary to any of our member towns? Duxbury. Because that, that's oh, the yeah. thing, it, it, it is the roots and and maybe it's appropriate to have islands that, that don't have connections. Um, but but right, if we cross, if we can get from Duxbury to Bolton. Okay. Yeah, I think Route 2 goes through there, doesn't it? Yeah, it doesn't go through Duxbury. Well, it's sort of, it's sort of it's north, right? You can get to Bolton from Richmond and Duxbury. Okay, so then Huntington there, Waitsfield, Buell's Gore, Warren. Um, yeah, I mean, these are all other towns that have sort of, that have some logical connections here. Uh, so you have Tom, Michael, then Henry, then Jeremy. Do you have any further feedback on why Rob Fisher made that particular suggestion? Because of the because a lot of the funding is going to, he expects, I think, uh, that a lot of the funding is going to come down into CUDs. Again, the thing that Ken mentioned at the beginning was that the legislature has to decide what to do with this um, you know, big pot of money. And if he's saying that there's likely to be $100 million, um, the legislature's current position is to have that stewarded by the CUDs. And for towns that aren't in CUDs, it may be a harder lift for them to go at it one by one. Whereas if they were part of a CUD, they sort of can get, um, we can think about them as a, as a bigger picture sort of thing. I just don't know if that makes sense for us at, at this point. Um, but I, I, I think that was Rob's motivation there because we will sort of, not that they're block grants per se, but that it, it would make more sense for towns to, uh, all work together. Uh, let's see, Michael, Henry, and Jeremy. So I I haven't read the the congressional bill. It's it's nine hundred pages, but I think the way they're doing it is they're going to give money to states and local governments separately. Yep. Local governments being towns in our state because counties don't do anything in our state. And though that will be true for towns that are members of studio as well. Mm -hmm. So our our constituent towns like Plainfield and Callis and Northfield and so forth may or may not share that money with PV fiber. But there is the reasonable possibility that if they want broadband, 
they see CV fiber as a useful vehicle to be more efficient than doing it alone. And so I think what Rob is saying is get some more of these towns into these CUDs so that they can be together in more of a force and more efficient. That may not be in the interest of every town. Um, so that's one thing. Um, secondly, um, I personally think that we have one of the more manageable right-sized CUDs in the state. We're, we're not angling to be 55 towns like NAK Broadband, and we're not six or eight towns like Memorial. We have a really good size that works. If our board keeps growing, I think it's going to get less efficient. And if towns are sort of far flung, I think it's going to be harder to design and, and to satisfy those far flung towns who come in later. I feeling a little conservative about what we have now. Um, and then to counter my argument that I just made, you can, even if a town is non-contiguous, we could still serve them because there are other ways to pop up in another town without running direct lines all the way through a bunch of towns to them. We can use Velcro or First Light or other ways to pop up in a town. So Island Town, if, if Buell's Gore is the only one that wants to join us, all three people who live there, we could serve them <laughs> as long as there's a middle mile route out there. So those are all my points. So that, that, that's interesting about the, the money going to the individual municipalities. I think that certainly changes the, um, certainly changes the approach and the philosophy about it. Um, <laughs> So, just got a direct question. Uh, didn't we vote on a maximum number of towns, like 23 or 25? Did we actually do this? I remember we talked about it. I don't think we actually said it. It was before you, Ray. It was before you. No, it wasn't before me. I, I was here when we had that discussion, and I was um, I was not in favor of the idea of capping it. I think I think we ought to have left it uh, and, and looked to see what opportunities were presented as we went along. And this may be just such an opportunity. Um, to add Bolton uh, or to add Waterbury, et cetera. I think that would be useful for us getting the money. I certainly don't want the towns. You can imagine the legislature getting $100 million and saying, uh, you know what, let's say there's going to be some towns that need money too. We're going to set aside $20 million for them and we're going to divvy up the rest for the, the, the CUDs. Uh, frankly, the fewer towns that are out there independent, more likely we're going to get a bigger chunk of the change from my view of the world but i think okay. it will be open all right so i've got i got henry next then jeremy then then ken then myself then david i i i think that it's good to get more towns you know in terms of bolton and waterbury i've thought about them uh, quite a bit and um you know they um bolton has fiber coming into it um and and Waterbury has um, you know a lot of, of cable, and um, so I think uh, you know the, the likelihood um, or the perceived uh, need is going to be different based on on what's coming into these um, other towns that we're entertaining. However, you know if we don't care about overbuilding, then you know why not include them. And, and, you know, if we get into agreements with utilities like Green Mountain Power or, you know, with other providers, then, you know, maybe there's, because Champlain Valley Telecom is coming um, into Bolton. And so we could connect into Champlain Valley Telecom from Bolton to serve Duxbury, for example. So some of these things depend on you know, our agreements with um, other providers and contractors and utilities. Uh, but overall, I, I support um, getting more towns, but to consider the factors I just mentioned when we um, add towns. Okay, thanks, Henry. Uh, Jeremy, Ken, myself, and David. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just going to ask uh, kind of a point that Michael brought up was, you know, are we going to start getting unwieldy if we start adding more towns? Um, and 
are we going to have trouble maybe making a quorum, you know, if we start adding more comments? Because sometimes it seems like we have trouble to get. Um, anyway, that's kind of my thought or my question, rather, for people to think about. I'm just counting how many. Uh, so we have, looks like we have 14 out of 20 towns represented here right now. Just uh, for the for the record, uh, Ken. Yeah, I just want to be clear about my, my understanding of this federal money. Um, Vermont is scheduled to get 1.2, 1.25 billion dollars. Of that, 300 million dollars goes to municipalities, and the mechanism for the municipalities. And, and that just you know, so you have a sense that's about five hundred dollars per person if indeed it's spread out on a per capita basis. Um, and but the but the mechanism for the use of those funds is very much an open question. What I was talking about in terms of the one to two hundred million dollars is a distinct state money. In other words, of not the three hundred million, but of the remaining nine hundred plus million, the discussion is. More than one hundred million dollars of that would be specifically allocated to broadband expansion. Okay, thanks, Ken. So um, I, I'm next on the list. So my my thought is that rather than sort of kind of splitting the difference, also kicking the can down the road like we did before, is that let's let's decide when the towns come to us. I have not heard back from the woman in Bolton. Um, I would I asked if I could get on the next agenda, but that the agenda for the last meeting in Bolton of the, their select board was last week. So if they are interested, if they're if they want a presentation, I'll give a presentation or somebody can and we'll cross that bridge when we get there. So that's kind of the status quo, but I, if everybody was like pushing for let's go and grab the last couple towns to make a nice contiguous block in Washington County. That's, I think we can do that too. All right, I've got David next. I, I looked at the, I just looked at the map. But a third of Bolton has fiber from Waysville Champlain, and Waterbury is 100% uh, cable. And so, in terms of a business case, I, unless there's a mandate that we do that the money is spent on 100 wanted, Waterbury is not a great case. Um, and Bolton, you know, if you know, we need to. I'm not a big fan of adding more towns myself, so I just want to point out that I mean, they are connected way to the telecom, and if that would help Duxbury, who knows? You know, there's some potential there, but right now, I'd say we don't need to add anybody like you just said, they haven't come to us. Correct. Okay, any um, any last thoughts before we, we move on? Okay, moving along, uh, email hosting. Um, this was a Something that we talked about previously. I, I don't know. Did we ever get? Do we have any quotes? Do we have any amounts of what this is going to cost, Chuck? I do. Um, so there are a few different models we could approach in how we try to tackle this problem. Um, one of the first mechanisms we could do is we could go out and just get an email hosting provider, and there are lots of great email hosting providers out there. But that always starts to beg the question around document storage, document retention. Uh, document sharing, you know, how are we actually sending files and, and so forth back and forth to each other as we are emailing. Um, and really, the, the, when you start to layer on the document sharing piece of it, the two big players remain Google and Microsoft. Um, and uh, on top of that, it is my personal opinion, given the specific needs of this board to be able to share documents in a way that doesn't tread on open meeting law and and open yeah open meeting law uh issues that microsoft is probably the better of the two candidates because they have the thick clients the the, the downloadable clients where you can actually still create a file and send it to people have them edit it and send it you know send back comments and, and stuff like that whereas everything in the google cloud is very much shared you can still do things there where you make a copy for each person and, and send it out to them but it's, it's a little bit uh a little bit bigger i think of a burden so let me let me let me start with that as sort of the, the context of which i did my exploration uh, the other thing I'll say is for neither of those two providers do we uh, qualify as a nonprofit. 
That said, they both do have governmental specific programs that we probably do qualify based on the letter of what they've written. Uh, but I haven't been able to muster any quotes uh, from the corresponding teams on the government side. So I do think there's a little bit of additional work to do here. That said, if we go after their business class tiers, the first way we could structure it is we could assume everybody on the board gets email, everybody on the board gets the document sharing, and everybody on the board gets a license uh, to the, uh, the, the desktop applications uh, you know, in, in the sense of Microsoft at the very least. Uh, and I'm assuming that we have uh, 40 people on the board um, plus three other people, a project manager, a clerk, and a treasurer, although in reality that will come down um, by, by one, it sounds like. Um, and so the pricing for uh, Google um, is uh, $12 a month. So we'd be looking at $6,192 a year to cover uh, all of the aforementioned people. On the Microsoft side of things, um, that almost same price, $12.50 a month or $6,450 a year uh, gets you the downloadable clients as well. However, there is an opportunity to save a little bit of money there if we have a number of people who already have access to the desktop apps or don't need the desktop apps for the course of their day-to-day -day business. You know, there are a number of alternates that aren't really participating in those, uh, uh, those sort of document sharing and changes and could uh, be relegated to using just the online tools for Microsoft. So if we were to assume that we only needed half the board to have the more advanced licenses that get you the desktop apps, we could bring that cost down to about $4,500 a year. Now, again, this is their business enterprise pricing. Whether government becomes more advantaged because they want to help governments out or whether because of the uh, slightly more sophisticated retention needs, it becomes slightly more expensive. I don't know yet. I'm hoping I will have that information uh, if we were to have another board meeting within um, two weeks time or, or when, whenever the next board meeting is. Uh, but I do think we at least know that the ballpark of what we're talking about isn't huge. And I, for one, would advocate that we go ahead and take the step to formalize our email, formalize our document storage, uh, have the correct data retention policies and so forth if we can secure the funds, which sounds like come at least in the, in the near term horizon shouldn't be too difficult. Okay, so um, we'll definitely have this on, on the next agenda, but if, if there are things that you want or the things that you're what you want us to think about as we're you know putting this together and by we I mean Chuck, um, please feel free to pipe up now. So I see Michael and David. Um, maybe I'm alone in this, but I think it's bananas. I really think that we can't afford that. I think that's just way too much money. I don't know that we need all the document retention features you're describing. We, I think we can create those on our own servers or on Google Drives or whatever. Um, Cloud Alliance and Kingdom Fiber by email boxes for 50 cents a month per customer and we give them away free to our customers. And you're talking about $12 a month, that's 24 times what I'm paying. I just question why this little organization needs to spend that kind of money. Okay, uh, David and then Phil. So, so Chuck, there may be one other option, I, I know that the state of Vermont, when it signs contracts with software vendors or even computer vendors, municipal governments are often able to take advantage of whatever the state of Vermont's pricing is. And so maybe reaching out to do that. And I'll disagree with Michael because I am tired of Google. So am I. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 Michael, the question is that that's just like what? Like pop an SMTP, then you just have a, a VM or something that's running Linux, and that just is your mail host. Well, we we don't run our own server. We we um, um, contractor provides us the service. It's IMAP. It's not pop. Um, they have a they have a web host, and and it's a client mail that you can put in any you know 
any any email client on any on any platform. Um, I'm not suggesting we use that one in particular. I mean, we could use there are free services like that are that are encrypted, like Proton Mail, or there's all kinds of Signal. There's all kinds of good mail clients out there, and if we don't need to have this kind of businessy setup that that stores documents and files, and just need, want email, and then we want to protect that email in folders, we can do that. Um, and Proton Mail would not be free if we're using our own domain. If we're continuing to use email addresses like Gmail, like we're currently doing, um, then you can do it for free. But if you wanted to have you know, aliases or if you wanted to have a, your own domain name, then it is a, they do have a plan. But it is, it is cheaper than $12 a month. But yeah, I definitely see your point. Uh, let's see, Phil. The, the issue, of him, I, I just have that through this for the town of Middlesex. You know, the issue for us as a public entity is that we need to um, comply with both federal and state regulations around um, especially email retention. Now, the whole document piece is nice because it helps with, you know, managing some of that, but all of our communications um, as far as doing business need to be able to be discoverable in terms of legal hold. Um, we might get sued, we might not, but if we do, we need to produce those communications within a certain period of time, um, or we're going to find ourselves in a very, very difficult situation. Um, and so the kinds of things that Michael is talking about are certainly possible to use, as long as we have another vendor that routes everything through it and it's then retained and it's retained for 10 years, I think is maybe the, the minimum with those kinds of things. And that's where a lot of the expense comes in. Uh, and certainly uh, companies like uh, Google and Microsoft have been doing this for a long time. Um, you know, we were doing this in schools starting 10, 12, 15 years ago. Um, and it is a fairly uh, big expense, but we do have an obligation under federal and state law to do this. And we, we you know, we've held off this long, um, but I think it's something we really do need to address as we're moving forward. So, uh, Phil, I would be interested as a uh, recovering select board member myself, the, yeah. um, the the federal requirement for retention and what, what you're talking about i've i've never i've never heard of that i'm not familiar with that i mean so discovery in the event of lawsuits i can understand that yeah. but pu public records um you know as long as you're not deleting documents i mean that was I how we that you didn't delete it sure okay right i mean so an, an attorney is going to shoot holes in it really really quickly um, if they're looking for something that you don't have, you say, but I never deleted anything. Prove it. Mm -hmm. I'll send you the citations. Okay, that would that would be that'd be helpful. Yeah. Just so I, just yeah. so we can be completely clear about what the what the requirements are, yeah. um, and it, it may be possible that there's a way to um, yeah. to tweak a mail server to to do this. Somebody yeah. else has been looking for a cheap solution to this in the past. I'm gonna guess. Bill, could you uh, send those to include those on me uh, to me as well, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, Jeremy. Um, so a couple of questions. Um, would we then be requiring all board members to use their official email addresses when doing CV Fiber business? And yes. the second question is then say someone leaves the board the whoever is managing this would then be able to get those emails so that would cover the case of oh rama's not on the board anymore but someone gave us a public records request for all of rama's emails we could then provide them with all of rama's emails without having to say hey rama give us your email right. again. correct okay okay any other thoughts for this as we move forward and have this on the next agenda? Yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. One thought. So I guess, Chuck, 
um, in terms of value, there's email addresses, there's access to the uh, you know Word and Excel and all these other desktop apps. What else is included in the hierarchy? Like for example, I think a number of us have okay. A number of us have access to the desktop apps elsewhere. So if all we're getting is the desktop apps, then maybe it's not. You know, maybe, maybe we could even trim it down further and just like get email addresses for me because I've got, you know, I've got Word otherwise. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Jeremy. And um, the the primary thing you get other than just email and the slightly more complicated scenario of email with the compliant retention policies and uh, able uh, ability to put on litigation holds and, and things of that nature, uh, you also get the, the shared drives, the, the, the document repositories where you can put uh, shared files and those also have uh, retention rules the administrators can put into place. Now, uh, my, my understanding mirrors Phil's that the retention policies on documents is not quite the same as the retention policies on email, although what exactly the nuanced difference is there, I don't know, and I'm not an attorney, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I think we have more research to do, but primarily what you get in addition to the desktop apps is that sort of shared Folder shared drive concept on top of it. I see. Okay. Thanks. And, and to Michael's point, there are other ways to do that. That's a lot cheaper. I mean, you can set up a web dev server on a, you know, on a on a random Linux box somewhere and have a shared folder that people can access. But it's uh, it's not not quite the same. Okay, uh, Siobhan? Does it come with Teams? It does. Okay. All right, so it looks like uh, we have some information. We'll have some more uh, decisions to make at the next meeting. Um, it occurred to me, so thanks for letting me know, um, Ray, that we missed an item, committee appointments. I know um, Phil Ciccini had uh, wanted to be on the finance committee, so we can uh, nail that down too, but um, Ray, you thought that um, somebody else was looking for appointments to other committees? Yeah, my recollection is, that, yeah, it's too bad it's here because you know, he might say no, but my recollection is that Tom wanted to be added to the, poly the uh, finance committee and the PDC, and um, perhaps if he could agree or disagree at this point in time. I did say something to that effect, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so we have Tom and uh, Phil Phil Sacchini, um, or to, both Tom and Phil for the Finance Committee and Tom on the PDC. Is there any other appointments that we need to make at this point? Who's going to make all the badges <laughs> for Tom? <laughs> we got, got a lot of cardboard here yeah, spray paint. I was gonna say my kids have a whole art section downstairs. They can uh, yeah, get some get some mod podge and glitter glue and stuff. You're you're gonna love it. Okay, so um, I'm gonna move that we appoint um, Tom Fisher to the uh, Planning and Development Committee and the Finance Committee, and Phil Sacchini to the Finance Committee. Second. Okay, uh, it's my motion, seconded by Siobhan. Any further discussion? Okay. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed abstentions, roll call requests. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, moving on to, uh, before we get to round table, Jeremy. So if the governing board is appointing the chair and vice chair, um, should that be voted on here? I think no. we're just going to we're just going to, we're just going to keep the finance committee where it is until May, and when we okay. reorg, we'll we'll that then. Yep. Okay. Okay. So let's do a roundtable. Uh, Phil. No, I'm good. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, I just want to say thanks to Christian for showing up and for uh, taking notes this meeting, and 
just when you, when you get the draft done, send it over to me. Um, I'll look it over and uh, we'll go from there. Um, hopefully fairly soon because we do have a requirement to send out a draft, I think within five business days. And I like to send the uh, draft to the board first to give them any chance to, uh, to make changes. So anyway, thank you. And, and on that note, I will send you an audio recording. This doesn't record video, but I will send that to you um, within the next 24 hours. And if you want the video, then uh, Orca will have that up in two to three days. Audio, I think, will be enough. I heard you repeat all the motions in seconds, so that should give me what I need. There are one or two. I... <laughs> all right. Let me try to get ready. Great. The, chat's also, the chat is also saved. Yeah. Da -da -da. Siobhan? I think that's a setting, though, actually. You can go into the settings on, uh, if you go into the settings, you can have it save the chat transcript. Yeah, it, just, it it'll, should just create a, a text file wherever it's, um, wherever it's configured to do so. In my documents or something. Yeah. All right. Uh, Alan? Okay, Alan's passing. Josh? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, just going to just let everybody know or make the, the, the entire board aware that I am um, uh, in work teams that are current insurance provider. Um, we're actually waiting for some applications um, so that we can rework our insurance policy to meet uh, the need of the member as they move into our future endeavors. Um, so once I have some of that, those uh, things and costs solidified, uh, I can come back to the board with that. Um, we can maybe put that as an agenda when I'm ready. Um, I can present that and then it may also give us an opportunity to revisit and maybe perhaps review what EC Fiber has for their insurance carrier, depending on what kind of quotes we come back with and the coverage that is offered to us. We are a bit limited uh, based on the fact of our municipality. Um, so, and in, in what carriers are are willing to uh, to assist with that? So I just wanted to give that that little bit of an update. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Tom. Yeah. Uh, probably not the next meeting on the twenty third, but uh, by the April one or, or either one, I guess it might be good for us to appoint a subcommittee on the transition, um, just so that we're not. It seems like in a when we've gone through that May, uh, a new uh, appointee on the board. It's kind of been a mess when we're going through one or two that kind of catching out old history. Um, just thought. Okay. We can definitely re revisit that as we get closer. Um, Ray? Well, I think I can get 100% agreement on this, though. I've already spoken too much, so I won't say anything more. Okay. Thanks, Ray. Michael? Good night, everyone. Good night, Michael. Thank you. Jerry? Nothing for me, thank you. All right, Lucy. First night, I'm just taking it all in. All right, thanks for joining us, Lucy. We do appreciate it. Uh, Henry. I'm um, sorry, I've been multitasking at this meeting, but um, did we enter into agreement with CVRPC? Uh, quite some time ago, yes. So CVRPC is now taking our minutes and doing other some other admin tasks for us. Okay. Um, Thank you. Sure. Uh, we're seeing uh, the minutes at least and some of the other admin stuff with David. Yep. Uh, John Russell. John is muted. If you have anything to add, John, in the next 30 seconds, we're happy to hear it. Um, all right. So uh, thanks again, Christian. Everybody can see uh, Christian's uh, email address there. Um, if you need to contact him for whatever reason, I would recommend that, as tempting as that is, that you don't. Um, if you have requests for him or for CVRPC, that you do it through David and Jeremy. So please, please send any requests that you have for them for admin sub through David and Jeremy. So on that note, um, I will declare us adjourned at 8.04 PM. Have a wonderful day, everybody. We, we did it on time. Amazing. Uh, we will see you in. Yeah.
on the 23rd. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Thanks, everyone.